Hi, I'm Rachel. It's a good reminder slide to start off by saying hi. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, like everyone else in this room, I exist primarily on the internet. Um, I am a data visualizer, design technologist, designer, developer, UXer, entrepreneur, etc. Um, yeah, and I'm very happy to be here today with all of you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I have not lived in San Francisco for a couple of years, and I've been wanting to go to this, and I always like forget about it until like a week before, and I'm like, no, I can't go. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, like everyone here, I absolutely love D3, um, and it's also kind of responsible for most of my career, so I owe a lot to it as well. Um, so yeah, so today I wanted to kind of just, I don't know, take a journey back in time. And uh, I was sort of, I was thinking a lot about kind of how I've evolved over the last five years that I've been using D3 and my approach to visualization. And so I thought we would take that journey together. Um, so I got my start um, working, both working and working in data visualization and with D3 at Stamen, which is a design firm here in San Francisco. Um, and I didn't actually get into D3 for the data visualization. Um, I got into it because Flash was dying. Those are the dark days. Um, and basically, when I joined Stamen, Flash was like just on its way out, and there was sort of this vacuum of like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do cool web stuff, and specifically animation, for the type of work that I needed to do. Um, and we sort of did a survey of the available tools, and D3, I don't know, seemed like the best one out there, so sort of like, oh, okay, I guess we'll try this out um, at Stamen. And so yes, yeah, so the first project that uh, we used this for was the 2001 Video Music Awards, um, which was also my sort of first major project that was out there in the world. Um, so we did a bunch of these over time for MTV, but the idea is that it's a Twitter tracker, and so this is back where you could consume the entire Twitter firehose um, through a third party, which is pretty exciting. Um, so we basically set up all these keywords for all the performers and then just listened and said, okay, you know, who's talking about who? Um, and yeah, it was really fun. But um, you'll see those triangles, that lovely layout of triangles. Um, so that was one of the things that I worked on, was getting that all figured out. Um, and uh, oh yeah, this is also showing kind of the selected view that you could go read specific tweets about Beyonce. You know, it was a simpler time. People were excited about reading other people's tweets. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I found this old screenshot of the first time that I had tried to do this like triangle packing, which you can see obviously it's just the circle packing algorithm, but with triangles drawn instead. And I think I like twiddled some knobs and like made them a little bit closer. And this is also back when I used Pinterest to be posting sketches. So I remember putting this up there and being like, oh, this looks pretty cool, like pretty good triangle packing. And you know, some random person commented like, looks pretty bad to me. Like, oh. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, like we continued on, and um, yeah, so that's a sort of based on fractals, except that the top three are pretty even. But um, to give you a sense of the animation, uh, oh no, yeah, God, videos, man, what a terrible medium. All right, hmm. maybe. Oh yeah, there we go, okay. So yeah, here's an old-timey video of an old-timey website. It's five years ago, um, but you'll see, oh man, look at that animation, that's so exciting. That was like the pulse of how much people were talking about it. And wow, it zooms in. This is really exciting stuff five years ago. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of what we're using D3 for, is this like, okay, yeah, we need to have this website that's constantly moving and flashing and pulsing. and. Everything all bounces around. Okay, here, you ready? Oh, look at that, that's so great. Who spent a week on that? This girl, right here. 
Um, but yeah, so this was the first thing that we did with D3. I was like, yes, this is amazing. I was also like just getting into being a web developer, you know, and being in charge of animation like is sort of a, a very difficult thing, I think. Um, I think it's a, a difficult skill, and I was suddenly the person kind of responsible for it. So, um, so yeah, this was sort of what I did for a while at Stamen and did all of these crazy animations. That, that's a giant, you know, SVG circles in the background on mouse move. You know, looking back, I'm like, oh god, why didn't I use Canvas? But, you know, at the time, it was so exciting. Giant circles. Okay, so I did several of those projects at Stamen, and near the end, I got to work on a very different project. This was for Facebook Stories, and it's Facebook's marketing department, and they wanted to show the sort of friendships between different people in different countries around the world. Cool. And when they first came to us, I was like, oh man, this is gonna be so great. We're gonna have like all these lines connecting all these countries. It's gonna be like so visualization-y. And they kept like stripping down the amount of data that we're getting. And it was like, what do you mean we're not gonna get all the countries ranked against each other? Because they, they finally wanted to do, oh, let's only do the top five. And then it was like, mm, let's not even rank the top five. Let's just have, you know, the top five and everyone else. Go. And it was just like from like a data of his perspective, you know, I was like, no, this is getting so boring. Like, no one's gonna like this. Um, and the thing that saved this project at one point is that they realized that like, of course, like Facebook is made of people and people have this entire rich history called human culture. And so of course there's reasons for these connections between, you know, different countries. And so they hired this ethnographer to write stories about why these different countries were connected. So you'd say like, okay, yeah, United States and Mexico, you know, are close, they share a border. Um, but there's other stuff like Brazil and Japan, where Brazil imported a lot of, or sorry, Japan imported a lot of Brazilian workers at some point, and a lot of them stayed in Japan. So there's like a, you know, connection on Facebook between those two countries. And that took this from just sort of a, like a circle packing nice thing to something that actually had a lot of meaning. And it was something that people are really responding to. Um, and it was kind of the first one that I remember, I don't know, I guess sort of like critical acc acclaim in a project that you put out there more than just like, oh, you know, it blinks and it's shiny to like, you know, people actually wanting to sort of explore and um, sort of spend time with your visualization. Um, so about this time, Robin Sloan put out something else, my main man, um, and he put out this a tap essay called Fish, and about what does it mean to love something on the internet today. Um, so this was available through the App Store. He was sort of playing around with the medium, but it was this essay that you could read through on your phone. Um, but the point of it that he wanted to make is that watching something twice is a radical act, and reading something twice is an act of love. And this really was impactful to me because I started thinking about the type of work that I'd been doing and sort of, you know, what did I want my, I guess, like legacy to be? What did I want to be putting out into the world? Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about this and was sort of like, oh gosh, I've been making like flashy Twitter visualizations and that's been, you know, kind of the meat of the work that I've been doing and like, is that all? Like, do I want to continue doing that type of work for the rest of my career? Um, and to me, like, I want to put it out there that there's nothing wrong with flashy, beautiful Twitter visualizations. For me, I wanted to do more than just that one thing. So keep doing flashy Twitter visualizations. I believe in you. Um, so for me, I wanted to move on, and I wanted to work on something um, that people might respond to on a deeper level. So I started freelancing. And um, yeah, I just went through a couple of different projects. I just wanted to pull them up as examples. Um, this was about the uh, different neighborhood data in Los Angeles. Um, and this was the first time that all of these different uh, sort of census indicators were available on one page. So you could compare proximity to a grocery store with economic income. Um, and it was the first time you could sort of see where different neighborhoods are sort of systematically more disadvantaged than others. Um, another project from about this time was for the Harvard Library Lab. Um, they had this issue where about 1% of books were being checked out, and 99% just sat there. So they wanted to have um, an explorer tool where you could sort of, you know, search for some keywords and it would pull up a lot of surrounding books. And you could do this online 
Um, you could filter by time range or by, um, by subject, the Dewey Decimal System. Um, and so we built this whole exciting explorer um, and then you could turn your selections into like a checkout list for books. Um, and it was about this time when I was sort of working on these projects that I started to be a little distrustful of D3 layouts, which I know is sacrilege to say in this room, but bear with me. Um, I think that layouts are so beautiful and so easy to use that they really capture, capture the imagination of a lot of people coming to visualization uh, sort of initially on. And I sort of saw this over and over again when I'd be talking to people and they're like, yeah, man, I really want to build a visualization that's like a chord diagram. Yeah, so I'm gonna make my data fit into a chord diagram. And you're like, oh, does that actually accomplish what you're trying to communicate with the data? And everyone's like, no, you don't understand, a chord diagram. And, and it was just one of those things, you know, where I was like, working with people and like had to sort of take a step back and you know, does this actually convey information um, in a way that a wide audience is able to understand? Um, and I was thinking about this sort of, that data visualization literacy takes time and that you know, everyone kind of understands a line chart, a bar chart, and you know, people make fun of pie charts, but there's also data saying that it's the most effective way to show a ratio. So, you know, <laughs> a lot of people want to do you know fancy like stick and rock graphs and all this really cool stuff. But a lot of time, over and over again, I was worried that those sort of um, flashy ways of displaying data were detracting from the actual communication of what people were trying to convey. Um, so in my work at this time, I was trying to really sort of pare back and stick to very simple chart types and stick to things that people um, could understand very quickly. Uh, this is an internal analytics tool for the New York Times. Um, and honestly, this is a pretty basic, you know, like page views over time and there's a couple different chart types. You can filter, there's a nice brush and a context on the bottom. Um, you all know these things, very straightforward. Um, and around this time, I was also thinking about this other idea, um, peak visualization, I was calling it sort of a play on peak oil, but I was thinking a lot about, you know, being a freelancer, being a data visualizer, what does that mean, where's my career going? You can do this a lot when you're freelancing because you have a lot of empty time to fill that you can just stress about your life. Um, <laughs> And I was, I was thinking about this sort of like distribution of visualization out in the world and I was sort of calling this the um, sort of the middle class of visualizations where it's not Excel and it's not some fancy custom visualization that takes weeks, but there's a lot of room in the middle where, you know, in a couple hours or a couple of days, you can get something that looks pretty good. And there's a lot of libraries, um, you know, in that vein that are coming up and certainly been on projects that are using them. And the reason this worried me is, of course, because my you know, bread and butter was coming from that custom visualization thing, and I was like, really hoping people would keep wanting to pay me for that. But, um, but you know, you're like, oh man, is this gonna end soon? Um, am I gonna run out of work? You know, that the New York Times one, I mean, the, basically the one custom thing in that project is this um, day of week view, because as you can see here, um, the New York Times has a, a sort of cyclical page view where it's high during the week and low on the weekends. And so just looking at that, I mean, it's the same sort of wavy graph and they wanted to be able to compare like Tuesday to Tuesday or Saturday to Saturday. So cool, but like, you know, how long is this gravy train really gonna run? You know, like how long can I really convince people to pay me lots of money to do these custom projects when like, I don't actually know if I'm adding that much value. So yes, the long night of the soul. Anyway, around that time, thank God, a friend of mine at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory reached out and was like, hey, Rachel, do you wanna come work at JPL? And I was like, what? And he's like, do you wanna do data viz for space robots? And I was like, what? Yes, <laughs> of course, duh, I'll be right there. I was trying to get out of LA, cause I was like, I'm not gonna live in LA. But then this happened, I was like, fine, I'll live in LA. Go full blonde, buy a convertible, try to do it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so the basic premise was like Elasticsearch is a thing and it just came to JPL 
and we could use some D3 on top of that, and then like, whoa, what would happen? Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the problem set that I was given, and it was fantastic. Um, I got to work with four different missions when I was there. There is SMAP, which is an Earth orbiter, um, looking at uh, moisture levels. And there is Cassini, which is orbiting around Saturn, and is also going to crash into Saturn next year, so get your love in while you can for Cassini. Um, there's Dawn, which is in the asteroid belt, and there's MSL, the Curiosity rover. Um, and so basically, this is what I was doing for them. I was making line charts, and oh man, every single time that I met up with one of my cool D3 friends, and they're like, what are you doing for JPL? It must be so cool, and I'm like, I'm making line charts. It's really cool, but they're like, line charts? I'm like, yeah, this is line charts. But I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if it's time series data and people need to see time series data in a time series, like, yeah, it's going to be line charts, <laughs> you know? Um, but I basically spent a year making the best damn line chart you will ever see in your life. And I can't show it to you because of ITAR restrictions. It's working for the government for you. Um, but I thought I would teach you a little bit about the type of data that I was working with so then you could appreciate some of the views that I can show. So, telemetry 101. So there's basically three types of data that is beamed down from the spacecrafts, um, which all spacecraft operations is based on these three types. Um, there's EHAs, which are a stream of numbers. Um, and so this might be uh, like a temperature um, or the torque of a mortar. Mort motor. Um, or you can also kind of um, abstract these, uh, sorry, blanking on all these words now, um, different modes that your spacecraft is running in. So if you have like an on or an off, you might send that back as a stream of zero and one. Um, or you can do more complicated things, like if you have a camera, you might be sort of getting in position, focusing, taking the photo, processing the data, zero through four, and you stream that back. And then people on Earth are able to reconstruct that as modes of what the spacecraft is doing. Um, this is all abstract because everything's sent back through radio waves. Your bandwidth is very low for spacecrafts, so you want to be as efficient as possible. The second type of data are these EDRs, event records. Um, and it's basically a print statement. It's a console log, um, but it's a pre-programmed pre log that is uh, sent out whenever something completes. So you might say start of sequence, end of sequence, um, any sort of warnings uh, are sent through in this format. Um, and basically, the, da the data type structure, there's seven different types, uh, three different types of warnings, as well as um, diagnostics um, and sequence information. Um, so you get one of those seven types, you get the text inside, and you get a timestamp. That's your data. Um, the third is this sort of lazy catch-all data products everything else, literally. Um, yeah, oh my god, standardization on spacecrafts is off the charts, and everyone has their own little like zip and encoding um, algorithm that they run things through, which makes it hell for people on our end, because there's no way to standardize across all the different subsystems. But anyway, a data product might be something like this, which would be a photograph of Mars. Um, but for in all intents and purposes, we were dealing with EHAs and EBRs which are uh, what was able to be put in an elastic search. So this is um, basically a view of what the EVRs look like. Um, you've got your different level, you've got your message. Um, SKET is spacecraft emitted time. Um, and you basically have your little list of logs. Um, and one thing that we did, which, you know, to a room of data visualizers, I got you. This is so obvious, right? You'd be like, okay, let's do a histogram of that. To them, they were like, what? <laughs> they had never seen their data like this. It was crazy. Like, this was literally like a show-stopping moment of like, check this out. It took us six hours to do, and they were like, what? <laughs> Look at that. Everything happens in cycles, and then we have that one time in the day where we beam everything up, and. Like, oh my god, and so this, I mean, you know, it's exciting when you get to show people a different view of their data and they suddenly are getting insights about it that they never saw before. And you know, this is one of those like, okay, yeah. 
justified and getting paid money to do this. <laughs> And this is sort of all of it in concert. So we built this nice thing where they, you know, previously they just had this list of EVRs that they could scroll through forever and ever. Um, and we built them this nice, um, both a histogram that could also be used to brush in on it. You could filter by level. And so we we're making it a lot easier to get down to the exact EVRs that they wanted to see. Because a lot of times, if you get a warning that you need to investigate, you want to see what happens on the spacecraft both before and after. So you want to be able to quickly zoom in to the time range um, that you need to be investigating. I just want to say, as an aside, I've done horrible, horrible things to JavaScript timekeeping, specifically for Mars, which is a pain in the ass. It's 30 minutes longer than an Earth day. And everyone stays on Martian time because you need to be planning things when there's sun so that both you have a camera, you know, you can see the, the photos that you're taking on Mars, and also there's a bit of a, like solar power um, in addition to the nuclear power on the spacecraft. So everything is like slightly off shifted and it gets like further away from you each day and then it like resets every three weeks, pain in the ass. And they also, I mean, you know, they want to see everything in a Martian time day. So then suddenly you're like trying to inject an extra 30 minutes evenly distributed across Earth time. Oh my God. Also, if you ever want to get into a fight on the internet, just talk about timekeeping and JavaScript libraries. Like, <laughs> holy fuck, everyone wants to fight me about that. And like, I don't get it. Like, people are like, oh, just use MoMA.js. I'm like, do you understand I'm talking about a different planet? Like. <laughs> And, and one of the engineers that I work with already submitted like a little issue and was like, mm, can we have a uh, Mars time on this? It would be really helpful for JPL people. And of course, moment jazz people are like, no, this is an earth thing. And like, Jesus Christ. <coughs> I could also talk to you about leap seconds, which are another awful thing. Yeah, once you realize that like, our timekeeping system is just kind of an abstraction that's not actually matching up with how the Earth works. Like, just it gets really uncomfortable because you have to account for that when you've got spacecrafts. <sighs> Another really wonderful thing that we did is they're like, oh, it'd be really cool if we could see a graph, but instead of like one time, you could overlay different times. So you could have like a start time and then do like 30 seconds from each of those start times. And that'd be great. And what you're looking at right now is Cassini when the thrusters turn on. And this is the uh, x and y axis position error. And you can see that those thrusters kind of throw everything off for a bit. And then it settles back down into, well, you can't see the settling, but it does settle. This is 250 seconds. Um, and this is one of these sort of winning things. This is looking at the rover. Uh, this is looking at. Um, earth control mode and autonomous mode, which I told you about those modes, and this is one of our nice representation of that on the graph. One of the reasons that we did a full custom D3 thing instead of just using a library was to get those um, enumerated channels, those uh, modes channels, uh, to be able to show on the graph. Um, and this is looking at, what is it, 10 sols um, in a full range. And you can see that nice little wake-up period that lines up between all these different sols. Um, What's a sol? Oh, sorry, that's a Martian day. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <sighs> you do this stuff for so long, and not everyone knows what a sol is. Sorry. Um, fun fact, I told you about the reset every three weeks where like, you basically sync up with Earth again. Um, it takes longer to make the plan for the rover than you have as Martian time. So every three weeks, there's a sol a day which is basically everyone takes it off because they can't work. <laughs> but the thing that I learned probably the most while working at JPL is a lot about kind of when we're talking about visualization, what goes into it. And I was sort of joking about making the best line chart for a solid year, but I mean, really, that is, that is what happened. Um, and, you know, for example, this is a view, this is what people would be looking at. You've got your little time conductor, your graph, different ways of overlaying things on there, lots of different um, data settings on the right. But probably most of you in this room, when you saw this, your eyes just zoomed into that graph area, 
And I bet you all started picking out, you know, like, oh, what's she doing for the axis? Oh, that's probably like a mouse event. OK, cool, she's got a line. Got some time, got some hovers. Um, and probably what you didn't spend that much time looking at is the time controller. Um, and this took longer than all the graphs to do. This was the one that took a bunch of time, um, both in researching, testing, and implementing um, to create this time controller. And you might see that there um, are three kind of different layers on here. We've got bookmarks on top, uh, which work differently for every mission because they have different ideas of when is a, uh, an amount of time that they want to look at. An Earth orbiter is in near constant communication, so you might have 24 and 48 hours. Um, Martian time is all going to be Martian time. Um, Cassini is this 24 hours, one week, 10 weeks, because Cassini is the end of its mission. So people are doing more long-term trending. Um, then we have these two text events, the text fields that are using UTC time. Um, there's a little calendar widget. And then uh, there's this other um, time event on the bottom, which you can be dragging to adjust your graph. Um, and this little time widget was like one of the selling features of this software because we managed to make a calendar that had both the date and the day of year and the week number on it. And I know this doesn't look that impressive, but honest to God, people have like a printout pinned up on their cubicle that when they're looking at stuff, they have to go over here and like find it on the piece of paper and go back. And for the people working on this, they were like, oh, I might even use your tool just to like convert time because like, thank God, I can just pick a calendar day and like I know what it converts to. And we have this for um, Mars as well because the telecon people um, and people actually dealing with the telemetry being streamed back to Earth were the one uh, subsystem on the rover that had to actually deal with Earth time. Everyone could stay in SOLs, but they had to do a lot of conversions. So we had this nice little calendar widget that converted it for them, um, which is one of those details, you know, that when you're first looking at it, you know, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, yeah pick the date picker. But for them, it was this, you know, revolutionary way of being able to access their data. Um, and I want to point out that this was all done through user-centered design, which was sort of the first time that I had done this in a formal setting for a visualization project. And I think most of us are sort of like this when we're coming up with our visualizations. I know I was. You just kind of mix stuff up, and you're like, yeah, I'm sure this will work. It works for me. Um, and this is something that we really had to focus on at JPL, is actually you know, getting into these more um, sort of formal design processes, which, you know, when I first got there, I was like, oh, so boring. Let's just get to the visualization. But, you know, once you actually start testing things and seeing like, oh, OK, there's a, there's a method to all this madness. And, and it turns into a visualization tool that people want to be using. All right, and now for something completely different. Um, so I couldn't stand up here and talk about for a while without mentioning the other half of my life, which is um, these sort of product companies that I've been working on for several years. Um, so the first one of these that has been going on for four and a half years at this point uh, is called Meshu. And oh, look at these nice lines. So Meshu is um, a jewelry company that is based on geodata. The interface is a map where you can add points and then it uh, makes the shape. And I just want to say that this would literally not be possible um, if there wasn't D3. This is, we like to joke that this is like the first commerce company based on D3. Um, but it's true, you know, <laughs> you got out there data based. And like also, I just want to say shout out to D3 Delaney layout because it's literally powering all of this. And uh, yeah, back in the day, I was like really stoked on that facet design trend. And then, like, lo and behold, I'm like combing through the layouts and find this. And I was like, yes, this is amazing. So I was really stoked. Um, but yeah, so we've been doing this and we've been making these products. Um, and this is also sort of a triumph of 3D printing and. Uh, laser cut um, products and you know able to make sort of custom one-off products um, for different people and something that's really meaningful to them um, has been a really fun project and you know at the end of the day 
like it's all data. It's all data visualization. It's data visualization jewelry, but of course, you know, have to sell it as something a bit more flowery so people don't get scared by that word. But you and I know. Um, yeah, and we, we put out postcards for people and people can write little notes and we've had some really wonderful conversations um, with people about how they're so excited to be making something that is so personal and based on their own data. Um, some of these quotes that people have written in. Um, but yeah, just kind of pawing through this, we've added some different kind of algorithms basically on the site, <laughs> jewelry lines, but you know, they're just algorithms. Um, yeah, this one's based on walking data where you could do uh, one point and then it picks 12 points around in a circle, picks out the path and then makes this custom shape. Um, so yeah, so to close, I wanted to show you kind of the stuff that I've been working on for the past couple months. Um, I've been really, really excited about vector tile data um, for maps. And um, I was working at MapZen and basically got like too excited about their data offerings to continue working there. And so I left and now I'm doing my own projects. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, this is an SVG rendering of San Francisco with no styling. This is the default uh, fill black stroke none. But if you can get that CSS rendering, then you have the ability to make these sort of um, infinitely customizable vector maps with high res data of anywhere in the world. So I was working on that, and um, the first thing that I did at Mapsen was to build this SVG exporter um, of all of this. Also, this is just based on a demo that my boss doc did, so I can't take too much credit for this, but I was doing a lot of data organizing on the download, and what that gives you is that you can pull it into something like Illustrator, and everything is organized. It's not originally organized because everything's coming through on a tiled uh, basis so that you know, it's quick to uh, be serving up the data, but then you want to be reorganizing it so that you can do all the color and fill together in groups. Um, and this is available up on my GitHub if you want to play with it. Um, I mean, I was like super stoked to be doing this because, sorry, I'll leave that up there for three more seconds. Um, but if you actually can use this then for people like me who like to make physical objects, um, you know, Illustrator is kind of the gateway file converter to getting to actual products. Um, so of course the first thing I did is I made a nice little poster of where I lived and you know, colored everything all monochromatic because that's what I like. And did some, um, some mirror etching. It's also really hard to take a photograph of a mirror which is weird, <laughs> it did not occur to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, uh, I started playing around with like, oh, what would street data look like as jewelry? And um, cause that's sort of my, my first love in all of this data physicalization. Um, and yeah, here are some photos of uh, where I've ended up on this. Um, that's 3D printed brass on the left and this is nylon on the right. Um, and yeah, this is the big thing that one of the big things that I've been working on, um, a new meshu line that is based on uh, vector tile data and streets, and you can make a custom jewelry pendant of anywhere in the world. So, to sort of bring this to a close, what I want to convey is that, you know, we all love D3, we all love how powerful it is, how you're able to do, you know, pretty much anything, because there's not a lot of constraints built into um, you know, the, the pieces that you're creating. And I'm interested in the sort of both concrete and abstract ways of approaching data. And I think data visualization is a very sort of, you know, straightforward, um, regulated, and there's, I don't know, it's basically like we all know what we should be doing for data visualization to make an effective piece. I also love the more abstract, artistic way of taking personal data, um, creating interfaces, you know, playing around with that DOM. So that, I think, is the real true power of D3. Thank you so much for listening to me, and I hope to hang out with you this weekend. Thanks.